more analysis now about what that means for you, the travelling public, and bring in Jeffrey Thomas from Airline Ratings. Really? Jeff, good to see you. Thanks for your time. Ed just ran us through the numbers there. It all sounds pretty dire for Qantas. Alan Joyce has suggested today that international flights won't take off again until mid next year. Is that the realistic view, do you think? The government's been suggesting the beginning of 2021 is, is the likely time when we could see those international borders open. Look, I think Alan Joyce is probably on the money. It's going to be about the middle of next year. And giving some more context to that, he did say that the A380s, the 12 A380s, uh, which that are now in the Californian desert, are going to stay there for about three years. So, and there are some people who say they'll never fly again. But certainly three years is a long time for a recovery. So middle of next year, yes, I think that that's going to be the... Uh, the time frame for, uh, for Qantas. Obviously other international airlines are flying in and out of Australia at the moment, but most of those are government owned, government underwritten. Uh, they're flying with very few passengers, uh, capped uh, at the moment. And of course, all those passengers have to go into quarantine. And I think that's the big issue. The quarantine issue, most people don't want to travel if they have to spend two weeks in quarantine on the return. And the other, the other big X factor here is the, uh, is the vaccine. We're getting better and better news about that, but still uh, the, the pundits are saying that it'll be the middle of next year till the end of next year before everybody's fully vaccinated. So I think uh, travellers, international travellers are looking at the second half of 2021 before they can start really planning with any confidence. Jeff, just to look further at what you were talking about there about the flights that are actually heading out at the moment, those you know, government-sponsored flights, what is the situation? How many flights are we actually seeing taking off from Australia to other countries on a daily basis? How does that compare with the sort of traffic we're seeing interstate uh, in between the states and territories? Uh, look, the, the number of flights that are operating are very, very limited, extremely so. For instance, Cafe Pacific uh, operating from Perth, for instance, to Hong Kong. It used to be 10 services a week. It's currently three services a week. No passengers, just crayfish being uplifted. Uh, Qatar Airways, another example. Most of their flights go out of here with chilled lamb to Doha. Uh, Singapore Airlines is operating uh, in and out of the country. Uh, for instance, out of Perth, again, if I may use Perth as a, as a, as a guide, three or four flights a week, no passengers, uh, approximately 50 tonnes of chilled pork. So a lot of these passenger planes that are operating in and out of the country, some are carrying some passengers, most are carrying freight in the belly uh, because uh, uh, approximately 40% by value of the world's trade goes by air and 90% of that goes in the bellies of passenger planes. And of course, with passenger flights severely curtailed, um, that freight is being sent out on especially chartered aircraft. But uh, getting back to your question about domestic, again, domestic has been slashed um, transcontinentally. You might have one service a day from Perth to Sydney, for instance, whereas before you'd had about uh, 10 or 12 a day. So the, the, net, the domestic network is operating approximately 17 to 18% of its capacity, and a lot of those are intrastate flights rather than interstate flights. Yeah, so when you wrap your head around those numbers, it's pretty clear to see why we've had to see so many redundancies in this sector. We heard more details today from Qantas about the thousands of redundancies of that airline. Does that also suggest, though, that when the borders do open up, that these airlines are expecting demand for overseas travel will then take some time to ramp up again? Because with so many redundancies, 6,000 or so, it doesn't sound like... Qantas, for example, would be able to, from a staffing viewpoint, to get back to its former capacity straight away anyway. Several, that's a very good question. Several dynamics to that. Yes, you've got 6,000 people who sadly have lost their job, and that's a tragedy because they're real professionals. You've also got 20,000 who are stood down and they've got to be brought back into the system. Now, when it comes to operating aeroplanes, you've got pilots who haven't flown for now months. They have to go through refresher courses, simulator training, uh, which is which is uh, which would take quite some time, and also the aircraft themselves, the engineers have got to bring them back out of hibernation. Uh, the ones that are, uh, are parked in Australia, you're talking the 737, which is the standard domestic aircraft. You're talking three to four hundred man hours to bring that back uh, up to uh, operating uh, uh, standard. Uh, so. 
ramping it up will be a slow process. At the same time, uh, according to Qantas, 95% of his 11 million frequent flyers want to fly. They want to get back in the air. So there's a pent-up demand, not just for people to go for a holiday, it's really about going to see loved ones that you've been cut off from. So there's a huge pent-up demand. Uh, ramping it up is going to be a slow process. Um, and of course, the X factor here, as we've discussed uh, earlier, is, is the border closures. You know, the borders opening, then closing, then opening. Uh, this is a very, very difficult situation for planners and quarters to really get ahead, their heads around what to plan for. Yeah, tough times indeed. Jeffrey Thomas, always appreciate your insights. Thank you. Pleasure.